I'm Jeff Thompson. I'm a firefighter. I am confident. I am brave. I am an overcomer. I am a father. I am a son. I am a brother. I'm Jeff Thompson. I am salt and light. Hello, that church. It's good to see y'all this morning, man. I am, uh, I'm excited to be here. My name is Jason Oliver. I am uh, the Connections Pastor. I'm on staff here. I am Pastor Scott's shorter, balder twin. So I know you think you're looking at Scott right now, and I know we look a lot alike, but I just want to let you know I'm Jason, okay? So I'm not Scott. Um, he's actually out uh, doing some really cool stuff. You know, in ministry, this stretch of time from pretty much Thanksgiving to Easter is just really, really busy. You know, you've got Thanksgiving, you've got Christmas, you've got the beginning of the new year, you've got Easter. A lot of things that really come up in, in ministry. And, and uh, one of Scott's favorite things, I, I'm not sure if Stacy's in the room, so I won't say it's his second favorite thing, but one of his favorite things is duck hunting. And, and that season opened yesterday, and he's out enjoying some time, uh, getting some time away to refresh and recharge and, and doing some duck hunting. And uh, he's having a great time. But he'll be back next week, rip roaring, ready to go, so don't, so don't miss that. And... Um, you know, I think that uh, I think it's cool how God kind of does some cool stuff. He kind of stacks the things that we enjoy to do before we have to kind of make this hard run. I have to, but we, we get this opportunity to make this this fast run uh, into some really awesome opportunities in ministry. So, so be be praying for them uh, down there as they have a good time. I'll be down there with them. Do we won't harm any ducks. I promise. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. The ducks are enjoying themselves. I'm sure it's a good time for them too. <laughs> Nothing to worry about there at all. Um, as the Connections Pastor, I have the, 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 the amazing opportunity to head up the guest services team. You, might, you, may, you may know who these, these folks are. Perhaps, perhaps you've seen a shirt that looks a little like this, and maybe you've even been a little jealous. I won't say envious, because that'd be bad, but maybe a little jealous. And, and you think, man, I'd, I'd like to have me a green shirt like that. And I'd like you to have a green shirt like that, too. I'll be honest with you. They, you know, they put me on stage here, so now I get to, I get to advertise. Um, you know, perhaps, perhaps you think, man, I'd love to get plugged in. I'd love to serve somewhere. I'd love to do something, but I just don't know. And maybe you think, man, there's a ton of guest services volunteers, so they don't need me. I want to assure you that's not the case. You're needed. I promise. But maybe you think, ah, I don't really like people. That's okay, too. I want to tell you this, we've, we've, we've got folks on our team that are introverts that don't want to say a word to anybody. There's opportunities for, for you if, if, if you don't want to talk to people. Maybe you, you'll walk up to like a door and carry a conversation on, right? Um, that's fine too. We've got folks like that that'll talk to anything or anybody that stands still for just a little bit of time and everything in between. So if you'd like to serve, like to be part of the guest services team, really, if you'd like to serve anywhere in the, in the church at all, we'd, we'd love you just to fill out your connection card, mark on there, I'd like to serve. I'd suggest that you write guest services on there. Um, but we'd love to have you be, be part of the team. So that's what we get to do, and we'd love for you to join the Army of Green Shirts. Hey, say this with me. Say influence. influence. Say it again. Say influence. influence. Say it one more time. Influence. influence. That's right. We all have influence, right? Even if you don't know you have influence, you've got influence. I, uh, I got a friend. I, I came to town here about six, seven years ago, and... Met a guy one of my first couple of days here. I, I work part time at the church. I'm, I'm part time on staff, and uh, another part of the time I work as a consultant in the auto industry. And I uh, I work with guys in the finance office. That's where you go after you say yes to buy the car and you sign a bunch of papers. I work with those guys. Now I teach them how to do their job in a way that's legal, legal, ethical, and moral. What they do with it from there, you know, I can only do so much. But I teach them how to do it the right way. But anyway, I came to town, and I'm, and I'm working with this, this gentleman, and, and he and I, you know, we hit it off. We got along really well, liked each other. Uh, I wasn't living kind of for God the way I was supposed to be, and, and truthfully, neither was he. But we liked each other, had a good time. As, as time went on, he ended up going to a different dealer group. We kind of lost track of each other. As, as a matter of fact, I just kind of lost track really altogether, and, and shame on me. But we were still Facebook friends. I didn't even realize that, but we were Facebook friends. And about four years later, about two years ago, I get a phone call. And he says, hey, uh, you know, I see the stuff you're posting on Facebook. Because in that time, I, I started to come to church, and my journey back to, to my relationship with God was getting stronger. And I, and I, was, I was, instead of posting the negative and, and argumentative and angry things, 
started posting, you know, positive and, and encouraging things. I became Caleb, uh, apparently, on, on Facebook. But uh, so I'm, I'm, he says, hey, I'm, I'm seeing this stuff you're, you're posting, and, and I like it, man. I'd like, to, I'd like to come to your church. and Can I do that? And I was like, well, yeah, that'd be great, you know. So he, he came kind of sporadically, kind of off and on. And, you know, we, got our, our, we kind of developed our relationship back a little bit. And, and, and what's really exciting, and I'll tell you more about his story in a little bit, but what's really exciting about this is that he credits me with having some major impact on his journey to finding his purpose with God, and, and I had no idea, you know. We have influence all the time, and we have no idea that we have influence. Luke tells us, actually Jesus said, that it's not the healthy you need a doctor, but the sick, I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See, oftentimes we think that it's about us. It's not about us. That's not, you know, one, once we're on board, once we, we say yes to Jesus, it's about everybody else. It's not about us. We are in week four of who do you know who, we, who do you, oh boy, who do you think you are? How about that? Who do you think you are? Week four, it is salt and light. So if you're, if you're taking notes, and if you're not taking notes, you can fill in the blanks anyway. You are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Salt of the earth and light of the world. You know, it's salt of the earth. Not salt of your community, salt of your neighborhood, salt of your school, salt of your family, salt of your job. It's salt of the earth. We are designed, we are God's body. We are, we are the, 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 the group of people that are going to carry out God's message and plan to the entire earth. We're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Again, these are huge, huge things. It's a huge plan. It's a huge undertaking. And it's going to be done on our backs. We're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. See, we're designed and intended to be God's kind of undercover change agent. Change is going to happen because of God through us. Not because of us, but through us. We're the change agent. We're the ones that are going to cause change to come. Our theme for this deal has been, been what? Because when you know who you are, you'll what? You'll know what to do. That's right. Because when you know who you are, you'll know what to do. We pick it up in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Turn your Bible, look on the screen, go to your phone, turn on Facebook for a minute, whatever it is. But Matthew 5, 13 says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? I think that's like the funniest sentence in the Bible. If the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? I just think it's funny. It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. And, and you know, we read that, right? And you hear, you know, you hear the salt of the earth. And, you know, you think salt of the earth people. That's good, just wholesome, down-to-earth people. That's what we think of. That's not what, what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying you're the salt of the earth. See, salt of the earth is like a good old boy or a good old girl. No, it's, it's, it's not about that. It's, see, we're a bad old boy. We're a bad old girl. And we're changed by a good old God. So we're not... We're not the salt of the earth because we're good people. We're the salt of the earth because God is good to us. That's why we're the salt of the earth. And you may think, man, salt's kind of weird. It's kind of a strange thing to use. I mean, today, salt is kind of the thing that, you know, you look at it on the table and you go, I probably shouldn't have that because, like, my cholesterol is too high and, you know, I'm going to die if I use salt, right? I mean, it's delicious, but I'm going to die if I use it. So, so you think, why did, why, did, why did God use salt? Well, there's, there's a bunch of things that salt does. And this is some of the blanks that we have here. Salt preserves. That's the, that's the next blank. Salt preserves. <clears throat> in ancient times, in Jesus' time, Jesus was the master of context. In other words, he knew who he was speaking to. If he was speaking to people that understood shepherding, he talked about seed. If he was talking to, to, to people who understood things of, of wealth, he talked about that. If it were landowners, whatever it was, he knew who he was talking to. He knew his audience better than anyone ever. And in this, in this instance, he knows who he's talking to. Salt, in his time, was the number two, most, the second most important commodity in their economy. Number one was the sun, because, well, it kept you warm, and it's light, and it's kind of important to grow stuff. I mean, the sun's pretty important. But number two was salt. And the reason that it was so important is because salt preserves. Before refrigeration, before chemicals, before all of the, the things that we have that help stuff last for like 37 years, they didn't have anything. So, you, you know, if you didn't use, if you didn't, it wasn't a single use item. If you had to use it more than once or twice, you needed something that, that, as a preservative. And salt 
is a, is a preservative. It was a, a preserver. Actually, salt was so important that it became a, 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 a form of payment. Um, oftentimes, people would be paid in salt. You may have heard the phrase, he or she's not worth their salt. That's where this came from. They were paid in salt, but perhaps they weren't worth what they got paid. So salt was super important. In God's economy, <clears throat> we are the salt, right? We're super important. We are his divine preserver. We are going to preserve the world for God. Next thing salt does is it purifies. When I was a kid uh, growing up uh, back in Maryland, we had hard water. I don't know what hard water is. It's like jumbo shrimp, but this doesn't make sense to me. We had hard water, and, and I guess it hurt when it hit you in the shower or something. I, I don't, strange, I don't really understand it. But we had hard water. So we had this water purifier, and, and my folks would, you know, they'd drive down to Sears, and they'd buy this super gigantic bag of salt, and it was, you know, taller than me. It was huge, which I didn't know tall, but it was this huge bag of salt, and my dad would throw it over his shoulder, you know, he'd carry it, and they dumped this salt in the, in the purifier. And, and so what happened was the hard water would, would go through the salt, and it would come out soft water, um, which I guess is better, right? So it would come out soft water, and, and, but it would come out pure. So the, the, the salt was the purifier. That was the, the catalyst, the purifier, to, to soften the water. See, we live in an impure world, and God has designed us to be the purifier in that impure world. So we are the salt. We are the catalyst to, uh, impure, to purify an impure world. So it also creates thirst. Perhaps you've heard a rumor that if you were to walk into a bar, they may provide you with peanuts or pretzels or chips and salsa, or something salty. And the intention would be to make you thirstier. Is that a word? Make you more thirsty. So that uh, you would order more drinks, run out the tab, spend more money. Intention, right? God wants us to be used to create thirst for the things that are important to him. So if our life is aiming people towards God versus away from God, that's the intention. That's why we're salt, to create thirst. Salt also melts. You know, we're coming into the wintertime. We may come across some, some ice or some snow. And, you know, like I said, I'm from, from Maryland. We lived in Pennsylvania for a while, and we would get some weather. Now, not like Buffalo weather where you get like 13 feet of snow. That was not what we would get. But we would get, you know, a little more uh, weather than, than we do here. And we would have these buildings, and, and they were just salt depots is what they were called. They were these circular buildings that came to a point, and they were huge. They were probably 50, 75 feet tall and 100 feet uh, across and these huge buildings and they were just full of rock salt or road salt to, to, to spread on the, on the roads uh, when, when the ice was coming and when the snow came. As a matter of fact, there'd always be this huge panic in the media on, you know, in, in, in January, February, March, depending upon how bad the winter had been. Oh no, we're out of salt and now we need to call Virginia and buy salt from them because I don't know why they have it or somebody else. And it was just, you know, what are we going to do? We have no salt. So when I moved here, we moved here, and the day after we moved here, the next day, we had a, you know, a little snowstorm, you know, an inch, two inches, something like that, and uh, shut the world down. You know, we were, we were scared. What did we do? <laughs> Panicked. I didn't know how, how we were going to survive, you know. But I'm out running around, and, and see, what would happen is the big dump trucks, you know, they would back up into the salt depot, and they would be filled with salt, and had a little spinny thing that would shoot the salt off in the back, and it was, it was great. And, you, you know, you liked following them because you could get traction and everything. So I'm looking for a salt truck. All kinds of trucks, but no salt trucks. I'm like, man, what do I do? So finally I'm driving around and I see a salt truck. I'm like, cool, I'm gonna, gonna kinda hang out with this dude. And I see that he's spinning around like brown stuff. And I'm like, what is he doing? That's not salt. And I realize he's throwing dirt. I didn't get it. I'm like, why is he spreading dirt on the snow? That just is the strangest thing to me. And then it hit me. I'm in Arkansas now. Ice and snow driving, not so much. But give us some mud, and we are squared away. <laughs> so no need for salt here, just mud. We're good, we're good with that. So. But, but, but salt does melt, and, and, and part of what we do is we're going to melt hardened hearts. Hearts that, heart, that are hardened to the things of God, we're going to melt, help melt hardened hearts. Salt also heals. Perhaps you've had a cut or a scrape or a boo-boo on your knee, and you, and you get into the salt water in the ocean, and you come out, and you feel better. It's amazing how the healing qualities that salt water has. Salt heals. We have on our side the ultimate healer. God can heal anything. Hurt from a marriage, a job situation, a relationship, something from your childhood, 
Whatever it may be, God is the ultimate healer. He can heal anything. And we are his ambassadors. <coughs> Forgive me, I'm sorry about that. As we move into Matthew chapter 5, in verses 14 through 16, we see that you are the what? That's right, you are the light of the world. A city on the hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it on a bowl. But instead, they put it on the sand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men. That's right. That they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. In Palestinian houses, they had one window, which I think is awesome. I'm like deleting windows on our houses. But they had one window. And at night, when the, when the sun would go down, they'd have to light a candle. Now, for me... I'm thinking, you know, you just take the lighter with the little curly thing on the end and you hit it a few, three or four times and it lights the candle. Everything's good, right? No big deal. As a matter of fact, we've even gotten so awesome that we actually have, in our, in our bedroom, we have remote control candles. It's the most amazing thing ever, man. You hit the button, the candles come on, they flicker, you hit the button and they go off. It's amazing. But these were not those times. And I'm so thankful we live in modern, modern times and I could hit a button and have candles. But anyway, they, so for them to light a candle... Man, it was, a, it was a strenuous deal. They'd have to, I don't even know what, you know, take two rocks and strike them together or something. I just, you know, there needs to be a switch or a button. But, but they, would, they would light a candle. So it was, it was kind of an arduous task. It was a big deal. And sometimes they'd want to go out, you know, like to the movies or something. And, and, and they'd, they'd have to leave the, the candle burning, but they didn't want to light up their house, you know, so the bad guys can see in, right? So they would take a bowl that had a little hole uh, in the top, in the uh, well, in the bottom, they turn it upside down, have a little hole in the bottom, and they would set it over the candle. The idea was is that it would keep the light from shining, but the hole would let enough oxygen in to keep the flame burning, so they wouldn't have to relight the candle over and over again. So this is what this is what he's talking about. This is what Jesus is talking about. You don't want to put your light under a bowl. You want to let your light shine. Light always overcomes darkness. So darkness can't swallow up the light. There's never enough darkness to swallow up the light. The light will always overcome the darkness. I want you to say this with me. Say, I'm the salt of the earth. The light of the world. A Christ-empowered influencer. And my life will make a difference. Let's say it again. I'm the salt of the earth. The light of the world. A Christ-empowered influencer. And my life will make a difference. Say one more time. I'm, wait with me. I'm the salt of the earth. I'm the light of the world. A Christ-empowered influencer. And my life will make a difference. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? That's what we're here to do. That's why we're here. That's it. We are the salt of the earth. The light of the world. Christ-empowered. It's not our strength. It's his strength. And our life will make a difference, not maybe my kind of sort of will. It will make a difference. It will. Let your light shine. Let your light shine. I love the choice of the word, let your light shine. <laughs> Letting your light shine is indicative of the fact that it's going to shine as long as you allow it to. There's, no, there's nothing you have to do. You don't have to really concentrate. Oh, you don't have to do anything. That's just weird and you look strange. You just let it shine. Let it shine. I know you're singing the song, right? <laughs> this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Right? Let it shine. Let it hide it under a bushel. That's right. You guys paid attention to VVS, right? You hung out. You got the cookie, right? Right? Hang on, hang on. Hang on. Don't let Satan... Blow it up. See, I like, I like better than, than blow it up. Like, like, that's just fun. It's fun. Because, you know, when you're a little kid, you blow in the back of somebody's. Anyway, don't let Satan blow it up. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. A couple weeks ago, we had a full moon. Did y'all see that? It was awesome. You could see the man on the moon or the chocolate chip cookie in the moon, whatever it was. My parents had me convinced that it was a chocolate chip cookie, and I was very excited because I love chocolate chip cookies. But I learned later on that it was not a cookie, and I was sad. And nor, nor was it a man, which is really strange. Um... It's a big, creepy dude up in the sky. Anyway, sometimes we'll look up and we'll say, man, the moon is really bright tonight. 
But is it really bright? No. See, the moon doesn't have any light source. It's a reflector. It's reflecting the light from the sun. So really, it's the sun is really bright, and the moon is really reflecting the light. We're much the same way. We, we really have no light on our own. We're reflecting the light of the sun, the S-O-N sun, but we're reflecting the light of the sun. If we allow it to be so, if we allow our light to be reflected, if we allow Jesus' light to be reflected through us, it becomes brighter and brighter. In Acts chapter 16, we come upon two pretty cool guys. We come upon Paul and Silas. These guys had been radically changed, man. Their lives were completely different because they had come encounter, uh, come, come face to face with, with, with the God of, of this world. See, they, they, Paul was walking around going, hey, are you a Christian? Cool, you die today. Are you a Christian? You're going to die today. Are you a Christian? You're going to die today. He was killing Christians, man. Kind of a crazy deal. Kind of a crazy deal. He, he's, he's heading down to kill some more Christians, and, and Jesus says, hey, Paul, you're not going to do that anymore. You're going to live a whole different life. And that's what he did. Silas, his life is completely transformed because of Jesus Christ. So these guys are out, and they're in Philippi, and they're preaching. Every day they're preaching, and they're getting arrested. Every day they're preaching, and they're getting arrested. They're preaching, and getting arrested. It's kind of a pattern. They're preaching, and getting arrested. So they're hanging out. They're doing their thing. Finally, right to pause. Finally, they'd had enough, and, and, and they're preaching, and they get arrested, and they arrest them for good this time, or so they think. So they grab these two guys. And, and, and you read over this, and it goes so quick. They were stripped, they were beaten, and they were put in the stocks. And you go, ah, that's a bad day. That's not a, that's not a really fun day. But when you dig a little deeper into it, you find out what, what they really did, man. They, 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 these guys were out. They were hanging out. They were publicly humiliated. They, were, they, were, they clo- took their clothes off in front of everybody, which nobody wants to see that. Not at all. And, and, then, and then they beat them. They flogged them probably 39 times. Uh, with a whip that had pieces of, of glass and stone, uh, different things in there designed to just tear the flesh off the body. It's just a horrible, horrible thing. And then they were put in the stocks. Now, if you're like me, you know, I grew up in Maryland, so I'm thinking colonial stocks, right, where, you, you know, you go and you get your picture taken, the little three little holes, the big hole for your head, until, you know, you... that one. It's not these, okay? What, what these stocks were, these were a torture device, and, and what the Romans would do is they would, they would take your legs... And, and spread them like a wishbone. So now you're, you've, been, you've been stripped down to nothing. You've been beaten. And then they're taking your legs and spread them apart. And they would take this, this wooden beam with, with shackles on the end and lock it around your legs. And the idea was it would induce uh, incredible uh, cramping and pain throughout your legs and hips. So now you, you've, been, you've been humiliated. You've been hurt. And you're being tortured. Oh, and by the way, you're in a dungeon. Cool, right. Not a lot of basements here. Um, somebody from the last server said that the closest thing, I guess, would be our storm cellar. So, but I, we had a house in, in Pennsylvania. It was an old farmhouse, 100 plus years old. And it had, in the basement, we had part of the basement was, well, it wasn't really finished. Like, it wasn't like, you know, the party room, but it had a concrete floor. So that was a win. And then the other part was just a dirt floor. And the dirt floor part always freaked me out. And I loved the concrete part because, it, see, it, it was really tall because of the concrete. It was really, actually, I'm sorry, really short. So I felt like really tall. I had to duck and stuff, so I felt like I'm a really tall dude. It's awesome. It's the only place I ever felt tall. But the, the, uh, the dirt floor part, it just freaked me out. It was, wasn't, you know, it was always kind of damp and musty and kind of weird. I didn't like it. I, that's the closest thing in my mind that I can think of, like a dungeon. So I can't imagine having had this really horrible, terrible, awful day and then having to go hang out in a dungeon with a bunch of other bad, bad folks, you know, doing bad things. And really all I've done is preached. I mean, goodness, that's terrible. Listen, I hope it doesn't happen now because nobody wants to see that. <clears throat> we pick up the story, though, <laughs> in Acts 16, it's, uh, verse 25. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to him. Did y'all catch that? Paul and Silas... We're praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to him. They had had this terrible, awful day, stripped down, beaten up, put in stocks, and they're praying and singing hymns. And here's what's cool about this. Paul and Silas didn't, didn't venture out and have a little meeting and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. If, if we get arrested today and we get stripped and beaten and put in stocks, here's what we're going to do. 
we're going to have a prayer meeting. No, 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 wait. Okay. We're going to say our memory verse. Let's, let's do that. Because there might be some people there who, no, no, no. We're going to sing our favorite songs because somebody might hear it. That's not what they did, man. They were in prison after this horrible, terrible, awful day singing and praying, and the other prisoners were listening to them. See, that was just a natural outpouring of who they were. That was Christ shining through them. That's who they were. They were living a life chasing after God, and their influence was nothing more than a natural outpouring of that life chasing after God. In verses 26, 28, it says, Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up because he was obviously asleep on the job. But he woke up, and when he saw the prisoner's door open, he freaked out. He drew his sword and was going to kill himself. And the reason he did that is because he knew that when when they found out that all the prisoners were gone, he was going to be executed publicly, and he wanted to forego that that whole deal, so he was going to take care of it himself. At that moment, Paul shouts, don't harm yourself, we're all here. Don't hurt yourself, man, we're all here. It's all good. Now, here's what's crazy. If I'm in prison, have this terrible, awful day, and, I'm, and, and God, you know, delivers me, man, I'm gone. Good luck to you. I'm out. I'm gone. I got, I got nothing to do with this, with this prison. But, not, but that didn't happen. Paul and Silas stayed put, but not just them, everybody else. They had enough influence in that time through, through God. But these prisoners stayed put too. It's just crazy. It's awesome. Again, we have influence. We have influence even when we don't know we're having influence. See, they weren't praying and singing so the other prisoners would hear them. They were praying and singing, worshiping God, but the other prisoners heard them. Takes us to our next point. That your salt and light living, it changes lives. Your salt and light living changes lives. We've already seen how the prisoners' lives changed. They stayed put. But your salt and light living changes lives. We pick, up the, pick it up in verse 29. It says, the jailer called for the lights. He rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought him out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Man, what an amazing question that is. I, I've had that happen just a few times in my life where somebody says, hey, I want what you've got. But just what an amazing just story and testimony that is of, 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 of Christ in our lives. What must I do to be saved? I had a gentleman at one of my dealerships. Again, I, for, I had known for a while, and, and he said, he said, hey, man, I've, I've seen something change in you, and you're just, you know, you turn into Caleb. You're not as negative as you used to be. And, and he said, what, what, what is it? And I had the opportunity to give him the same answer that Paul and Silas gave the jailer. And he said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. I had the opportunity to say to him, hey, just believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus as your savior, savior and you will be saved. It's an amazing opportunity. So he sought, the jailer sought them out because they were living a life following after Jesus. And that'll happen to you. It'll happen to you. You know, sometimes we think there's got to be like a church-wide activity. Hey, you know, why, doesn't, why don't the church do this? Why don't you all, you put this, this event together and, and we'll go do it. That's not, that's not what we're talking about here. You live your life where you are. You're strategically placed. And it may just be for a moment. That guy that I talked to, the next day he got fired. But the point is, is I had that, that, that opportunity to talk to him. I had a split second decision. Do I talk to him? Do I give him the right answer? Believe in Jesus and you'll be saved? Or do I just kind of move on with the conversation? God gave me the strength and the courage to say the right things at that moment. You never know who's going to be in your life and out of your life for just a short moment of time. So be salt and light everywhere you are, every chance you get, every opportunity. Don't, don't let the opportunity pass, pass you by. Verse 32. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in the house. And at that hour of the night, so in the middle of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. And immediately, he and all his family were baptized. So not only did they become believers in Christ, they also went ahead and got baptized. The jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole family. Many people believe that this family is who started the church in Philippi. Perhaps you've, you've heard of the book of Philippians. That's who that letter would be written to. It would be this jailer and his family in that church. These two guys were in jail preaching the gospel. 
They get arrested. They go through all they went through. They're praying, they're singing. There's an earthquake. The jailer comes to know Christ as his savior. Starts a church. Has a church that is impacting people today. You think, I can't make a difference? Yes, you can. You could be salt and light right where you are. You may not be Billy Graham, and I assure you, you're not Billy Graham, okay? And you may not be Pastor Scott or, 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 or Pastor Chuck, but you know what? You're you, and you're where God wants you to be. A couple of weeks ago, a young lady came out of the worship center crying after, or during church, and I was at the information booth, and I looked over to her, and I said, are you okay? Kind of secretly hoping. She said, yeah, I'm fine. But she didn't, so I had to, had to help her. And I said, well, what, what can I do? And she said, let's go talk. And I said, okay. So we sat down and, and we talked. And she said, you know, I just don't know why I'm here. What, what, is, you know, what does God have for me? And I said, well, what do you mean? And, you know, when we talk about identity, right, and we, we talk about identity being who we are in Christ. But, you know, sometimes, I mean, we really struggle with, you know, I'm a, I'm a teacher. I'm a plumber. You know, I'm a, I'm a musician, I'm an athlete, I'm a, I'm a mom, I'm a dad, brother, sister, whatever it may be. And we get these, these labels and we struggle with where our identity is. But, but more importantly, when we say, okay, cool, I'm a, I'm a believer in Christ, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christ follower, that's who my identity is. And then we have that moment of, now what? And that's where she was. She said, you know what, I know that I'm not the label that I was given. I am a fully committed follower of Christ. But now what? I'm not a professional Christian. I, Maybe I need to know more. Maybe I don't have enough knowledge. I don't know what to say. So God just gave me this question. I said, well, what do you what do? You do? What's your job? And it comes out that she, she works uh, the overnight shift uh, in a convenience store here in Sherwood. And she gets to see people that many of us will never see at a place in their life that many of us will never reach them. She, she may be dealing with somebody who's come out of the drunk tank. Maybe it's a prostitute. Maybe it's a, it's a police officer who's seen the most horrible things that we could ever imagine. But maybe it's a single mom who's there counting her pennies and, and nickels and dimes trying to buy something for her baby but just doesn't have the money to put it together. And she, shows, she goes on to tell me that what she does is, for those folks who are at maybe a really, really tough time, she'll just give them a cup of coffee. She'll, she'll be a, an ear to listen, a shoulder to lean on. Or maybe it's that mom that, that's, the struggle to make ends meet. She said, you know, I got those diapers. You just go ahead and go. And I said to her, I said, that's it. There may be something else God has for you, but right now, that's what God has for you. See, you are strategically and uniquely placed where you are to reach people that will never be reached by somebody else. It's your opportunity. It's your opportunity to be salt and light right where you are. You are. You know, I mentioned my buddy earlier that, that, that came back to church, and you know what's really exciting is that some of you guys are going to make a decision today to say yes to Jesus, and you're going to meet my friend Sean at the I Said Yes booth. Because, see, what's happened is God allowed me, for some reason, to reflect him to a guy who says, you know what, now my most important thing, the most important thing to me is when somebody says, I say yes to Jesus, I'm going to help them figure out what the next steps are. It's his passion. His heart breaks to help people who are, who are new believers in Christ find their way. I mean, that is so exciting to see that come full circle. And you know, it takes time. It takes time. It doesn't just happen overnight. It takes time. Be salt and light. Be salt and light. Be salt and light. The light will always pierce the darkness. Always pierce the darkness. Your light will never be overcome unless you put a bow on it and say, hey, I've got mine. I'm good. I'm a believer. I'm just going to hang out over here. No. Take that bow off. Let Jesus' light shine through you. Be the salt. Be the salt that... That, that preserves, that purifies, that, that creates thirst, that melts, that heals. Be that salt to people around you. It's where you're positioned. It's why we're here. It's why God has us breathing and upright. That's it. That's it. You're the salt of the earth. 
and the light of the world. <laughs> Sometimes as Christians, we like to run away. We go, oh, secular music. Oh, bad things. Oh, and we get scared. Oh, movies. And we get scared and we're moving away. No, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus went to those things. Hey, no, no. Let me bring my light. Let me bring Jesus' light to you. Don't just sit back and let it come to you. Have them say, come to me. No, go to them. Be the salt and light where you are. And let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine, right? Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. Maybe as we're, as we're talking about, maybe as we're talking about salt and light, there's, there's somebody that comes to mind. There's a, there's a face that you see in your, in your mind or, an, or a voice, I'm sorry, a name that, that you hear. As you think about them, you think about who you need to, to, to have influence on or who you can have influence on. Who, who does God want you to be salt and light to? Man, if there's somebody like that and you say, Jason, look, I, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know if I have the right words or know enough Bible verses or, or whatever it is that I need, but, but there's somebody that I know I need to be salt and light to. Man, if that's you, just, just raise your hand up. Nobody's looking around. Just, just raise your hand all over the room. That's right. We need to be salt and light, Christ-empowered influencers all over. That's right. That's right. Maybe you're not a believer in Christ. Maybe you don't know what that looks like. You say, man, I, I, you know, this, this thing sounds great, but I don't, I don't really, I, I, this whole say yes to Jesus thing, I've never done that. I don't know what that looks like. You know, I'm going to give you an opportunity to say a prayer that will change your life forever. If you want to know what it looks like to be a follower of Christ, if you want to say yes to Jesus, just, just say these words after me. Just say them in your heart. God hears and understands what you're saying in your heart. Say, God, I know that I've done wrong. I know that I've, that I've, 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 I've broken the rules. I've sinned. I've done things I shouldn't do, God. I know that in my power, I can't make that right. I know that only, only because Jesus came and, and live the perfect sinless life because he allowed himself to be sacrificed because he died and because he conquered death and, raised, and rose again on the third day. Because of that, I can claim eternity in Christ. Today, I say yes to Jesus as my Savior. I want to take that step to live in an eternity with you, God, not separated from you. If that's you today, I just, I just want to pray for you. If you said that prayer, you've made the greatest decision that you could ever make. And your life will never be the same because of the decision you made today. God, I, I just, I pray for this, for everyone here today, God. God, I pray that, I pray that you give us all the strength and the wisdom and the courage to be salt, to be light, to, to be your, your empowered change agents. In our, in our families and in our lives and in our communities and all over the world, God. I pray that we don't let it stop here, that we take it out with us, that we make an impact for you across the world. God, I pray for the folks that have made a decision to follow you for the first time today, God, that you, you will encourage them, that you'll wrap your arms around them and love them, that they will palpably be able to feel your presence in their lives. God, most of all, we thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.